Chris Stevenson. Chris Stevenson. Chris Stevenson. <laughs> wow. I mean, this guy is a serious writer. He's, he is one of the top sports writers in Ottawa. You I can know. tell how serious he is because he's got that huge beard. <laughs> Apparently, he didn't have it when he started. 30 years ago. Yeah. And also, he's a radio personality because mm -hmm. he calls the Sens games. Uh, he does, like, the pre- and post-Sens game shows, which is amazing. Oh, okay. They just, so he does the Sens stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Do you think maybe he could get me into the boys' locker room? Well, there's only one way to find out. find out. Let's find out. Hey, how you doing, Chris? <laughs>
Yeah. I even go back far enough that there was no 24-hour sports TV or 24-hour mm -hmm. uh, sports talk radio or anything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you were crossing your fingers when you went to bed that the next morning nobody would have found out and yeah. that you could actually have a scoop. That was probably one of the most gratifying and, things. And, the the lands sir, and the Sorry, landscape say, has yeah. just changed significantly well, now, so much in right? Fact, like even with, with, like, with like Twitter and that, for example, yeah. the, whereas a reporter used to get the scoop now, the, the the person whose story it is just tweets it out, yeah. and they have it. So, is, is that a lost thing? Is when this... you think about it now, because you know, going back and talking about kind of like that that twenty four hour cycle, where if you did have a scoop and you wrote for a morning paper, yeah. you know, it hit somebody's uh, doorstep at six thirty a.m. and and that was basically your story for the day, yeah. right? Everybody else was was chasing yeah. that mm -hmm. story for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. Um, now I would think for the most part, whenever news breaks, and this isn't specific just to sports, but when news breaks now, you're right, it's usually through social media now. It's going to be through Twitter or somebody saw something and, and posted it on Facebook or Instagram, yeah. whatever. Mm -hmm. um, now I would say that, that most consumers, most readers, listeners, viewers would be hard pressed to tell you what was ground zero on any story and who actually broke the story now. Yeah. That, that's probably the biggest change. Yeah. And that's you know, sometimes you question now the credibility of sources when it is as wide open mm -hmm. as it is and the spectrum is as wide with, like I said, Twitter and Facebook yeah. and Instagram and everything else. But yeah, that's probably been the biggest change in my close to 30 years in the business. Oh, I bet. So, so you're, you were with Sun and yeah. now you've moved on to uh, writing for NHL.com. Yeah, among yeah. other things, and again, like just, you know, the way the media landscape has changed with the contraction of the newspaper business and yeah. what we've seen just recently in, in uh, a bunch of markets across Canada with the consolidation of newsrooms between mm -hmm. Sun and, yeah. and yeah. Uh, Post Media. And, you know, I fear for some of my colleagues that were far from the end point in terms of, you know, what's going to be happening to, to uh, newspapers in this country. But uh, yeah, I, I think the challenge now for uh, a lot of people of my generation is going to be to kind of reinvent yourself from that type of uh, work environment that I was just talking about where it was the newspaper and that yeah. was it mm -hmm. um, to all the various you know, platforms that you've got now. So you know, I probably do as much work uh, doing radio um, and some TV now as I ever did in terms yeah. of, of newspaper stuff. Mm -hmm. That's right. So yeah, that's yeah. that's going to be the and that's going to be the challenge for for journalists moving forward now is going to be to to reinvent yourself. It's kind of be the jack of all trades, right? Model. Yeah. 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 I mean, again, it you know, it, it still all comes down you know, and it's it's such kind of a corporate and trite description now like a content provider. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for me there is always going to be that that you know, demand for information, right? Yeah. No man, it's just the way that it's changed, the way that the, the, the big change is the way it's been delivered. Mm. But people are still going to want to know, like, you know, what's what's the extent of Carey mm -hmm. Price's injury? What mm -hmm. is, you know, who's going to be playing on the Senators' top line going into the game tonight? Mm -hmm. People are still, more than ever, hungry for information. Yeah. You almost find, too, that, like, with the, the sort of new te technology with respect to receiving news, and because we're getting that 24-7, yeah. you know, with the CNN feed and all of that stuff, that people are even more, I don't know if you find this, more hungry to know um, as quickly as they possibly can what's happening with games or what's happening with players or what's yeah. happening with trades and deadlines. Like, it's yeah. in your face all all the time. And I don't know, as a, as a writer, if you, if you need to be more diligent or differently uh, sort of informed, I, you know, if that's... How uh, that works? You know what? I, I still think, Allison, the fundamentals of, of doing your job haven't changed that much. And mm -hmm. again, like for me, it still goes back to those relationships yeah. with people in order, you know, have that two-way information going. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think that's changed. I don't think it will change. It is still the people who are, uh, are, are plugged in yeah. um, and probably most important, credible. Mm -hmm. In terms of their, uh, in terms of their sources and the veracity of, of what they report, I don't, you know, I think those still have to remain the fundamentals of of the journalism business, mm -hmm. no matter what way the delivery system is changed. Yeah, true. Mm. Like I see, you know, you see it way too many times now. People are just 
in such a rush to be first, being right seems to have taken a backseat back seat. in a lot of cases. Yeah. yeah, a lot of them are willing to risk being wrong yeah. just so they can still claim that they were first and yeah. then they can yeah. correct themselves. But like I said yeah. now, with yeah. the way things have changed, it's rare now almost yeah. when, unless it's something particularly controversial, mm -hmm. people don't even really remember who was first anymore. And yeah. that's probably the biggest change from when I started anyway. Mm -hmm. yeah. When was the last time you skated on the Rideau Canal? Uh, I'm going to say four years ago. Okay. What is your favorite park in Ottawa? Favorite park? Park, yes. My favorite park. Uh, the one that runs along the uh, Rideau Canal there where I rollerblade. I don't even know the name of it. Okay, we'll take that. So Canal Rollerblading Park. <laughs> Correct. Have you ever been inside the Parliament Buildings? Yes. What is your favorite bar in the Byward Market? Uh, Clock Tower. Okay. Where do you go to be recognized the most in Ottawa? Uh, on this show. <laughs> what is the last Ottawa restaurant you dined and dashed at? Uh, Clock Tower. <laughs> Name the establishment that you were last kicked out of. Uh, Clock Tower. <laughs> what would be your favorite street to streak on? Uh, oh, right on Wellington in front of Parliament Hill. <laughs> Where in Ottawa was the last place you were arrested? Uh, Clock Tower. <laughs> <laughs> What area of town did you last go through a ride program successfully? Uh, oh, no. Actually, that would have been West End leaving a hockey game. West End leaving a hockey game. On the way to Clock Tower. Oh, on oh, the way. Okay. So Sorry. there's a theme there. You did very well. I'd say you Thank scored you. probably yeah, you did. six out of ten. You did really there. well. Really unfortunately, well. Unfortunately, you have to hit no. seven to get a prize. But oh. yeah. <laughs> I know you just missed it. It's okay. Previous guests, what's the what's the record? Yeah, we're not so allowed to give you that So you should have told me what the record was, yeah. and I would have tried harder. Oh. Imagine it's ten out of ten. Because I am just mailing it in right now. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Now you you touched on this slightly because you said when b before that you today you kind of have to reinvent yourself. Mm -hmm. You got to do multiple things, and one of the other things that you do is um, you do the pre and post game shows on uh, TSN, TSN twelve hundred, right? Yeah. Now how you've been doing that for a long time, though, right? Mm -hmm. So how did that come about? Uh, well, going back to the earliest days of uh, the centers, of course they had the uh, the broadcasting rights, and they wanted to build you know a show around. The game so started out uh, you know just doing you know uh, small hits on some of the pregame shows over the years and mm -hmm. over the last uh, you know 25 years it's it's evolved and wow. uh, again um, as the business changed there was more opportunities right when I started there was no 24-hour sports talk radio in Ottawa I mean the rights That's were true. held by CFRA which basically came on a half an hour before the game started and mm -hmm. and broadcast the game and and that was it. So, uh, like I said, more op with, with the way the media landscape changed, there were obviously were more opportunities with the advent of TSN and 24-hour and yeah. talk radio and everything else. So mm -hmm. that's pretty much, they, they needed to fill all those hours and pretty much there was nobody else available to do mm -hmm. it. So I got a chance. And were you happy to oblige? Like it was something you liked doing? For sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because I, mean, I, I hear you all the time on the radio, and I and you're so and then natural. And you immediately you're, change the station. Yeah, but before I do, like just before I turn the station yeah. and roll my eyes and like, oh, God, I'm not him again. Uh, I think to myself, why wow, he really sounds good. You know? He doesn't know what he's talking about, but boy, no, he sounds not, good not, saying see, it. No, I can't say that because I don't know anywhere close to what you know about hockey. I'm sure even Allison knows more than I do. So I wouldn't know if you, if you knew what you were talking mm -hmm. about. In fact, I was going to suggest what you should do to really you know, ramp up the program <laughs> is have someone like me on who doesn't know a thing about hockey. So you could say, okay, Norman, what do you think? And I'd say, well, I think they should probably get uh, George Chevalier or something. Or I'll Maurice I'll make a note of that. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll bring that yeah, up. I think it would be beneficial. So um, you've been to a lot of games, written about oh. a lot of games. Is there one game in particular or one of many, I'm sure, that really stands out? Uh, there's, you're right. There's been a lot. Yes. I think, I think it's usually the situations where you feel like there's going to be a lot of pressure. I think the one I would think of now is... Um, you know, the 2010 gold medal game at the Olympic Winter Games in Vancouver, Canada, USA. Oh my gosh. And you think about uh, the amount of attention that's on that game. And mm -hmm. beforehand, yeah. you're thinking, you know, what can I possibly write out of this that's going to be mm -hmm. 
relevant afterwards. So yeah, I, I would say that that's probably up near the up near the top of the list. But boy, there's been so many things. Uh, Saku Koibu's first game back from uh, his battle with with cancer. Um, yeah, just a lot of them. Mm. And you know, one of the themes we've been having is you never know what the story is going to be and that's part of you know part of the uh, the magic of it part of the challenge of it part of the misery of it mm -hmm. yeah. is there'll be times when you're sitting there with 10 minutes to go in a hockey game wondering what what is the story going to be and then having to uh, to write it in the space of 90 seconds well, yeah. because something dramatically changed mm -hmm. do you ever try to to, to sort of guess or not guess, but I should say, do you ever try to kind of figure out what you're going to say in, in the event this happens, in the of event course, that happens? Yeah, and you, you do, that? do that. Yeah. Well, in those instances, so, you know, if you're covering a Stanley Cup final playoff game yeah. and it's gone into overtime, and with deadlines the way, are, the way they are today, you have to file a story as soon as the buzzer goes. Oh, I was going to ask about that, yeah. Yeah, so you got to file, like, a, the second the game is over, you need to, to file something, and then you can head off to the dressing room to talk to players or coaches mm -hmm. and... and you know, have an opportunity yeah. to recast and write another story later on. Mm -hmm. But you've got to file as soon as that final buzzer goes. That winning well, goal is scored. Right. So in that instance, you would have two stories written just waiting for the details to fill in okay. at the top. I see. Okay. So are you writing the story oh. as the game? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, I That's didn't one know of the complaints that. of my friends is like, oh, I love reading your tweets during the game, but then when you get to the third period, you know, the tweets dry up. <laughs> Well, I've actually got to do my real <laughs> job at that point and wow. actually write. So. I didn't know the deadline was like that quick of a turnaround. Yeah. And, I uh, understand. You yeah. know, so it's funny because if you look down the length of the press box yeah. in the third period of this close game, mm -hmm. and here are all these journalists who are there supposedly trying to cover the event, and you look down the length and everybody's buried in their, <laughs> their typewriter yeah. writing. Yeah. And Mike Farber, a Hall of Fame writer and uh, I would like to say he's one of my my mentors and friends had a great line about the way the business evolved and everybody who was covering the game is writing furiously in the third mm -hmm. somebody would ask him the next day how was the game last night and his answer would be I don't know I was covering it. <laughs> <laughs> that, yeah. that everybody was kind of yeah. on their keyboard in the third period writing because they had to fire when that yeah. And that winning goal. Do you still enjoy the game still? Like even though you're yeah, you're buried in that? Yeah, like, yeah for sure. Yeah. You know, and I think uh, as you said, oh, you grew up in Montreal, you're a Habs fan. I was a Habs fan as a kid, but yeah. we root for stories now. You you you're rooting for what you think is gonna be the best story that night and maybe it's the guy, you know, who's been in a long slump finally gets a goal or or a uh, guy who's been injured, you know, or a big yeah. comeback. But you know, you you root for the story. Yeah. At this point, sorry. Sometimes it means rooting against the Habs or rooting against the yeah. Senators yeah. because that's the better, yeah. the better story. But you know, you want you want to write something that people are going to be interested in and, and want to read, mm -hmm. and uh, spread around the hockey globe. So yeah, you're rooting for the story. Cool. If you let's say try to imagine for a second, if you weren't a writer, if this wasn't your thing, what? do you think you would be into? What, what do you think your profession would well, be? Well, I, I would, you know, I grew up as a kid loving sports, not just hockey, all sports. So I would yeah. like to think that it would be involved somehow in, uh, somehow in the sporting world doing what? I, you know, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I would have loved to, uh, to be involved in sports somehow. So, you know, this has worked out pretty well yeah. um, that you could kind of have this intersection of, you know, yeah. your passion and your vocation. Yeah coming together. It's amazing. A lot of people would want that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's got its, its stresses and everything else, but what job doesn't, well, what right? Doesn't. Look at the yeah. stress yeah. you guys have to undergo doing this show. And talking to people like me. Look at the stress that I have to deal with sitting beside him every day. She says that, but she's really she's right. enamored with me. I think, you know. I think the counter's holding up all right. Yeah. <laughs> Thank God. Um, so, speaking of other sports, because you were into a few, mm -hmm. you is, you also cover, cover golf as well, right? yeah. Sometimes, yeah. and and that's a, a thing you play golf. You love mm -hmm. golf, mm -hmm. and you love to write about it. Yeah, that's yeah. you know probably been some of my uh, you know the the uh, most memorable and most pleasurable moments I've had doing a job have yeah. been like 
you know, having the opportunity to walk the fairways in a, on a beautiful summer's day on some of the most famous golf courses in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, watching the uh, the best players in the world, both men and women, different pace playing that game. Cool. Yeah. Oh, from hockey. hockey. Oh, well, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. just yeah. The, the whole the whole way you do the job, right? Mm -hmm. Um, hockey, when you travel with the team, you, you uh, are most of the time you follow your story. Within an hour, you're on a bus going to the airport to get on a plane to fly to the next city. Mm -hmm. And yeah. people often say, Oh, what a great job, glamorous. Yeah. You get to travel to all these uh, great yeah. cities. And, yeah. like, and I'm not saying there haven't been opportunities to go out and explore you know, great cities. There have been. But for the most part, you see the inside of the rink, the inside of the bus, the inside of the plane, yeah. back on a bus from the plane to go to a hotel, mm -hmm. grab some sleep, back on the bus to go to the rink for the morning skate the next day, right that afternoon in your hotel room, go back to the rink, yeah. cover a game, yeah. and get on a plane again. Yeah. So it might be interchangeable. It could have been any city that you were in in that kind of cycle and that's the wonderful thing about covering a golf tournament is is the cycle of the week is is so much better you're going to be in one hotel room for like eight days mm -hmm. yeah. which i've done my share of living out of a suitcase to have that luxury yeah. of being in one place for like eight days yeah. beautiful weather nice yeah. weather for, most, the most part, for the most part mm -hmm. yeah. unless it's you know the british open and the rain's going sideways but uh yeah two completely you know, two completely kind of different yeah. experiences from a work standpoint. And do you find that athletes are easy to approach with respect oh, to Oh, it's getting gotten worse and worse over the years. Seriously? Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Why so? Why? Yeah, what do you think? Um, I think, you know, I think a lot of it with the way, you know, things have, have evolved. Um, athletes have become much more uh, aware of their brand, a word that I hate, but it's mm. become part of our, our lexicon. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, access much more controlled now by the teams. And again, this is part of the, the changing landscape, right? Um, you know, one of the things, and you know, here I am working for NHL.com, you know, who would have thought that, that leagues themselves would have kind of become, you know, media operators themselves? That's um, true. Which is, yeah. you know, everybody now, NFL, Major League Baseball, they have their own TV networks, their own, you know, very professionally run websites. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. providing their own content. So they're getting out in front of it. They're, they're providing the content as much as private That's media true. companies are now. You know, as a result of that, the athletes are, are their property. Access to the athletes is much more controlled now. Mm -hmm. um, you look at it, you know, why, why do, you know, big sports leagues and that, they don't want to just be giving their athletes and their information away. Mm -hmm. So access to athletes now has become uh, much more curtailed to when I started. Um, you know, I just think accessibility is a lot more uh, of a challenge now when it comes to dealing with athletes. And in many instances, athletes now uh, are interested in putting their own message out there through social media. And, and they're, so they're almost cutting out the middleman, right? Which is, you know, the old mainstream media mm -hmm. um, is almost being cut out now by the leagues and by by uh, athletes in many cases themselves. But know? as we touched on before though, that's also happening with other news stories, right? The actual story itself For is sure. linking the story. You know, no that's question. The, yeah. And you know, uh, you know, we've certainly seen the rise of kind of the, the uh, you know, the quote unquote amateur news gather. I mean, how many big breaking stories now do you see that are, uh, you know, thanks to a video that somebody shot on their, their, their phone. iPhone yeah. or yeah. their Blackberry or whatever. Exactly. So yeah, just the access to, Athletes and the challenges of, of doing the job mm -hmm. are probably uh, much more, uh, it's a bigger challenge than when I started out for sure. Very simple, either tell us your most embarrassing story, and I mean most, or just do what's in the envelope, piece of cake. You mean most embarrassing professional story? Uh, uh, yes, yes. Nothing that happened at the clock tower. No, 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 oh, no, yeah. no, no, no. <laughs> I think we know the clock the tower's already banned you, so. Okay. <laughs> Um, my most embarrassing story professionally uh, probably occurred in the senator's dressing room in the oh. early days. It might have been the first year of the senators. And I had written a story about uh, a player for uh, the senators who unfortunately is going through uh, a hard time right now with post-concussion syndrome and such. Mm -hmm. um, Mike Peluso, who had been pretty much a rough and tumble guy around the league, a goon. And he came to the senators and actually showed that he had some hockey skills. He might have 
been close to leading the team in goals that first season. Wow. The Detroit Red Wings are coming to town, and they have Bob Probert in their lineup, who at the time was the heavyweight champion of the National Hockey League. And the story I wrote was along the lines of, here was Mike Peluso, who used to be this tough guy, but has now evolved into this very valuable member of the Senators. And in, in earlier times with Bob Probert coming to town, pop, people probably would have just expected him to be fighting Bob Probert because that's what he did. Now he's too valuable to do that. They need him on the ice scoring goals. The headline on the story winds up being, Probert versus Peluso, question mark. <laughs> so show up at the rink the next day, get into the dressing room, talking to a player in the corner of the room, and Peluso comes off the ice. <clears throat> steaming. He's already shot a puck at me from the ice. And I'm like, was he, was he kidding doing that? Comes into the room steaming. And Mike Peluso is an intimidating individual. Okay. At the time he had, you know, the hockey hair mullet going. Yeah. Six, three, four, 220 pounds. Comes in steaming toward his stall. Sees me in the corner throws his gloves off into his stall. You're nothing but a joke as a sports writer. <laughs> this, this was embarrassing. Right. Yeah. Sitting there. Yeah. yeah. That moment, another player, Jim Thompson, comes out of the shower. Oh. Allison with his, his towel wrapped around oh. him. With his towel wrapped around him. Yeah. yeah. Comes over to join the fray. And who wrote that I'm going to New Haven? I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> so, you know, here I am early in my sports writing days, yeah. sitting with these, the two toughest guys on the team looming over me, questioning my bona fides as a, as a hockey writer. Right. Anyway, wow. it was a feud that lasted for about a week, okay. um, but ended up resolving itself and uh, no punches were thrown. Good. Ooh, that's good. Now, had there been, do you think he could have taken them both on? <laughs> uh, one, not at the same time, but one at a time, yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm okay. still thinking about the guy in the towel. Yeah, I, yeah, she's still with the guy in the shower. <laughs> but you guys flexing. But that's and, you. All right. Well, one of the things that we want to do with this show uh, is to is to put the writer in the spotlight because oftentimes um, we find that because we've been writing for years and it's the mm -hmm. same thing. We find that people seldom remember that it all starts with with the script or the the book or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. The final product has usually got that moment. It has to start when that you first put pen to paper. But before we do that, before we do that, Allison had a question you wanted to ask him. Remember? I don't know. What? Oh yeah, yeah. You wanted to ask him if he could get you into the locker room with the senators. <laughs> and I figured you'd forget so I want to ask for her because it was very important. Do you her. want to get me in the locker room or do no. you want to get no, in the locker room? You had room? wanted to know if, if Chris could get you uh, in the yeah, locker room. Yeah, I know. Room. I'm just saying I think you yeah. want to get in the locker no, room I th too. I, no, I, well, you know, I didn't want to put him on the spot, but I mean, if you're throwing that question out and, and it's, it's out there yeah. right now, I, I, the, I wouldn't no mind. No problem. <laughs> there you go. See, I'll see you later. Okay, so you guys can, you guys handle that yeah, off camera. Yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll work out the details later. <laughs> off camera, please. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to give you a couple of minutes to reflect and gather yourself. And then um, we'll uh, see you on the other we'll side. See you on the other side. All right. All right. Thank you. See Thank you shortly. You. All right. Wow. That was one of the worst television shows I've ever been a part of. This was, I believe, Norm, supposed to be a, a segment of your show where I was supposed to read from one of my favorite pieces. Frankly, the story behind one of my favorite pieces is much better than the piece itself. Uh, 2003, I'm in Florida working for Sun Media covering the uh, NHL All-Star Game. And we were at a press conference that morning when, of course, word comes that the Columbia Space Shuttle had disintegrated on re-entry. So we get the call from head office in Toronto that they want a couple of the hockey writers to go to Cape Canaveral to cover this monumental disaster. It was interesting to see the reaction in my business among the hockey writers, which was basically to head for the hills. Nobody wanted to actually have to write about real life. We love our little cocoon of just covering hockey and listening to Danny Heatley's cliches. But myself and Eric Francis, who at the time wrote for the Calgary Sun, commandeered one of our uh, colleagues' SUV and started to drive north from Fort Lauderdale to uh, Cape Canaveral to cover this disaster. And uh, 
just, uh, you know, being there, the, the whole rush that you get from being there, not knowing, like, what was going to happen in the next 10 or even 15 minutes, and, and this is your job, and you've got to, to, to deliver. And completely unscripted, just coming at you at uh, 80 miles an hour. Um, we arrive in Titusville, which is near Cape Canaveral. I drop Eric Francis at a donut shop. I go to a fire station. Um, luck of the draw, Eric winds up with the best story of this, this woman who, having lived there, knows the routine of when the space shuttle is returning. And at a specific time, there's a sonic boom as the, as the space shuttle is coming in for the landing. And her dogs used to go crazy. So she would gather her dogs on her bed and wait for the sonic boom to comfort them. And at the given moment, of course, there is no sonic boom because there's no space shuttle now. Seven astronauts gone. And at that moment, she knows like this, something, hor something horrible has gone wrong. Eric Francis did a wonderful job of writing that piece. I had my moment. The next day, we go to Cape Canaveral, and they have already a, an astronaut's memorial there from astronauts who had given their lives in the, uh, the course of the space program. So people lined up for hundreds of yards to pay their respects at this monument. And this car pulls up to the curb, and a gentleman gets out with these bagpipes. And he stands on the curb and just starts playing these bagpipes. I'm getting emotional now talking about it in front of this monument. And all the people in the line just turning and listening to these soulful notes of these bagpipes playing over uh, by this memorial by Cape Canaveral. So, you know, one of those instances where I went to Florida thinking I was going to be doing one thing, wound up doing completely something else. Um, that's the beauty of, of my job. People say that I'm a sports writer. I would say that I'm a a writer who writes about sports, and in this instance, I got a chance to write about something that was much bigger, much more important, and meant something way more to a whole bunch of people.